Hi, welcome to lecture 7 of 3020 EDN. The topic of today's lecture is defining what is science. So the learning objectives for today is obviously to define science, but more specifically to explain the epistemology, ontology and praxis of science with examples. We should be able to describe with examples the various scientific methods and also define with examples key terms that we're going to be using in the science classroom of hypothesis, law and theory. But first we need to go cover some definitions. So we're going to be talking a fair bit about three key terms. They are epistemology, ontology and praxis. So when we talk about epistemology, we're really talking about the theory of knowledge. What counts as knowledge within a particular field? So for example, we've already covered that in mathematics. Now we're going to do the same for science. And science has a particular way of looking at what actually counts as knowledge and what actually counts as facts. When we talk about the ontology of a particular field, we're talking about their theory of reality. What constitutes reality? What is reality? What is not reality? That's what we're talking about. And the last term that we need to define is praxis, or the accepted practices within the field. Because science has particular practices, mathematics has particular practices, each key field of endeavour that we have as humans has particular methods that they employ and we're going to be talking about those in relation to science today. So before we get started what I'd like you to do is just to pause this video and have a think about what the question and have a think about the question what is science? How would you define it? How do you think your future students would de define it? Okay? So pause the video and have a go at writing maybe a one or two sentence definition for what is science. Rightio, so let's go all the way back to the very beginning of this story. Okay? When we look at the word science itself, it actually comes from a Latin word, scientia. And scientia just means knowledge. So you can see it being used here in the University of Queensland coat of arms and motto. So their motto is scientia. scientia Labore, which just means knowledge through hard work. When we look at other definitions, for example those provided by Aristotle, he defined science as the body of reliable knowledge itself, of the type that can be logically and rationally explained. And if you look at your definition of science, and if you ask people in the, on the street what, how they would define science, this is pretty much how most people would define science. Science is a series of textbooks or science is knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with that definition, but through the process of this course, what we'd like to do is to expand your definition of what constitutes science. So let's have a look at the epistemology, ontology and praxis of science. So as I'm talking, what I'd like you to do is to classify each one of the various topics that we're going to be talking about or concepts that we're going to be talking about as either epistemology, what counts as knowledge, as ontology, the view of reality that particular field has, or whether it's a practice where therefore you put it in the praxis column. So let's get started. Okay? So when we have a look at science, they view knowledge in a particular way. And one of the key ways that science views knowledge is that science is Knowledge is tentative, that it's being updated in the light of better evidence. And there's many, many examples that we could use, but here's one. So for example, in science, our understanding of the atom has actually changed over time. So this particular graphic that you can see here is incomplete because it began all the way back with Democritus, who was an ancient Greek philosopher who came up with the word atom. Much, much later, it was picked up by the scientists that you can see in the, in, in the graphic here, who developed, updated and changed our understanding. So for example, John Dalton um, hypothesized that the atom was, uh, was like a, a solid billiard ball. Okay? That, that was the, where the, um, th that's where we get the idea of the solid sphere model. That was eventually updated by J.J. Thompson, a New Zealander, um, with his plum pudding model, updated again by Rutherford, updated again by Niels Bohr, and finally the current view of what the, the reality of the atom is provided there by Erwin Schrödinger. 
So you can see how knowledge has changed over time in relation to the atom. Another great example of how knowledge has been updated over time is our understanding of the universe. So for example, we as humans used to believe that the Earth was the centre of the whole universe. Um, that was put down on paper by this guy here, Claudius Ptolemy, who came up with what we call today the geocentric model. That is the Earth is the centre of the entire universe, not just solar system like we understand it today. However, through the work of the two guys that you can see there on the right, of Copernicus, Galileo and also Kepler, that understanding of the solar system in our universe was eventually updated to place the sun at the centre of, of the universe as they thought of it then. And we currently know that our sun is really just the centre of our solar system and is, much, is, is part of the much bigger um, uh, uh, universe. Okay. So what you should get from all that, that really that science does produce knowledge. That's one of the, the key activities of science, producing knowledge. But we want to produce knowledge which is replicable. That is, if I conduct an experiment here in Australia, that can be confirmed by my colleagues over in China or the USA or in Russia, that it's convergent, that any findings that I make as a scientist are corroborated by other scientists from other fields. We can't have um, say, for example, um, anatomy disagreeing with physiology, for example. We want it to be universal, the, the type of knowledge that we're producing. So we don't want it just to apply here and now. We want it to be true, whether we're on Mars or whether we go to the Andromeda Galaxy um, a million years from now, uh, 10,000 years ago. We want it to be universally true. Scientific knowledge is also cumulative, which means that we understand more and more over time, adding to our library of knowledge. We want it to be testable and falsifiable. And key in that, in those two last two points, is the role of hypothesis testing within science. And that's one of the key practices which differentiates science from other fields of knowing that we have. So in summary, science seeks to be more comprehensive. We want to know more. We want to, uh, we want to be more accurate, that we want to you know, know it in more detail, and we want to know that knowledge more precisely over time. Another thing that science seeks to do is to remove human bias, and that's given rise to a term called instrumentalism. That is the use of objective scientific instruments for the gathering of data. So for example, what we can lay down our um, experiments on a continuum from subjective to objective. So there are subjective ways of measuring and understanding the world, and there are more objective ways of measuring and understanding the world. So for example, say we're going to take the temperature of a cup of tea, we can either dip our finger into the cup of tea and then decide on the temperature, or we can use a thermometer. Okay? So there are methods in between this scale, okay, with the dipping your finger being more subjective and using a thermometer being more objective. What we're trying to do is remove the human element from the measurement task. And this is one of the key practices within science. Another thing that science tries to do is to seek universal truths. Okay? Now, notice how in the, one of the earlier slides, we were using capital R for reality versus lowercase r. Well, we can use the same concept for truths. Okay? So we can, call it, we can talk about capital T truths, which is objective truth for all time, or we can talk about lowercase truths. And these are the kind of truths that we get to in science because we are constantly updating. We can never be 100% sure or about what we're finding within science, whether it's legitimately true or not. So we refer the, to them as universal lowercase t truths. So for example, um, Newton. He was the guy that came up with the formula that you can see on the screen here, which describes the force between two objects with mass um, 
anywhere in the, in the universe. So once upon a time, we as humans used to think that the laws governing the affairs of man and events on Earth were different to those laws which governed the universe and stars and, and the heavens. Newton was the one that came up with this equation that showed that the same force that caused the apple to drop on his head while he was resting in the backyard is the very same force which keeps the planets in motion. So whatever laws and truths that we come up with in science, we want it to apply no matter where you are in the universe, no matter when you are in the universe. Another thing that science likes to do is to rely on testable statements. And this is intimately tied to the notion of hypothesis testing. So you can see the three gentlemen here on the screen. More than likely you would have heard of them before. You all made testable statements in their work. So for example, Einstein, who's famous for his theories of general and special relativity, he laid down testable statements in his papers, which were only verified 50 years after those papers were published. The gentleman in the middle, Mendeleev, he was the one that created our current uh, periodic of uh, elements. And he was able to predict the existence of new elements that you can see there listed on the screen. Charles Darwin, someone from my field, he was able to lay down the laws of evolution by natural selection, but he quite openly admitted in his seminal work he didn't quite know the mechanism by which information is transmitted from parent to offspring, and that was only discovered a hundred years after his death. So while theories can be developed and not fully formed at their birth, later scientists can come along and actually fill in the gaps. Okay. Another thing that science does is it only investigates the natural world. Now, what we mean by the natural world is in opposition to what we call the supernatural. So all the examples that you can see up there on the screen are what we would call the supernatural, above the natural, beyond the natural. So angels, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, leprechauns, banshees, voodoo, the afterlife, wizards, wiz witches, the, um, and magic, they are all part of the supernatural. So science does not investigate those. It restricts itself to natural phenomena or investigating the natural world and providing natural explanations for events. So it never boils down to, oh, angels did it, or ghosts pushed that glass off the table, for example. Okay. Science is also evidence-based. What that means is that over time, we collect evidence to show that those ideas are correct. So the examples that you can see on the screen there are what we'll call not evidence-based. So for example, astrology, um, Chinese astrology, tarot card reading, palmistry, vaccines causing autism, all of those examples are not evidence-based. There is no evidence to support the basis of those ideas. Okay. Now, what this means practically for people in the real world is that when we look at science, what we should be considering is the entire body of knowledge on that particular topic. Because it's quite easy, as you can see, to find articles on the internet which say broccoli is bad, and you'll also find articles saying that broccoli is good. Now, the way that we should be using science is to consider the, 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 the body of knowledge as a whole. So, for example, things that you can do is rely on meta-analyses. And these are special kinds of studies which gather up every single study which has been done and using a set criteria, they decide on good quality studies versus bad quality studies. And then they summarize all of those good quality studies into what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And what we should also, another thing that we should be looking at is the scientific consensus. So this isn't some kind of street poll, box pops kind of idea, where you go out in the street and ask them whether they think that climate change is real. No, you ask people 
who live and breathe, who work within that particular field, what their particular uh, opinion is because they are more likely to have a good understanding of the complete body of knowledge within that particular topic. Okay? And another thing about science is that the theory is the pinnacle of scientific knowledge. And so all the gentlemen that you can see there on the screen, they have key theories which underpin each one of those fields. So for example, in physics, it's Einstein. In my field of biology, it's all underpinned by the theory of evolution by natural selection developed by Charles Darwin. Lemaitre is the guy when it comes to cosmology. because He's the one that initiated the theory of the Big Bang. We can look at Alfred Weniger, who came up with the theory of plate tectonics within geology and within chemistry, Dalton and a whole range of other chemists who are working on the particle theory and refining and developing our understanding of the particle over time. So all of these have the word theory in their name. And when you talk to people on the street, they tend to use theory in a derogatory way. That is just a guess. That is just somebody's wild, crazy idea. They use it all the time in CSI um, when they really mean that they, they think they have a hypothesis of who the murderer was. In science, the word theory is the pinnacle of scientific knowledge. This is what everybody is actually working towards. Developing, testing, working out the extent of theories, what it applies to, what it does not apply to, and seeing if we can use theories to explain more and more phenomenon over time. So a more correct definition of theory is what you can see on the screen. It's this interconnected system of ideas with internal and external logical consistency and supported by multiple lines of evidence that have explanatory power and predictive power. So it's not just one single idea, it's a number of ideas which are interconnected. And not only are they interconnected, but they need to agree with one another, which is internal consistency, but they also need to ag agree with ideas outside of those fields, which is external logical consistency. And that's what we mean by supported by multiple lines of evidence. So for example, if you look at the theories of climate change, or if you look at theories of evolution, all the respective fields within those areas actually support those two ideas. Not only then do they need to have explanatory power, they need to be able to explain all the findings or the majority of findings which have come before it, but they need to be able to have predictive power, that is, generate hypotheses which are able to test the boundaries and effectiveness of that theory in explaining not only old knowledge, but also new knowledge as well. Okay. So here's an activity for you. Now this is a, this is a graphic organiser and it's a great learning tool to help you and your students define terms. So what you do is you put your target term in the middle there, in this case it's science. What I'd like you to do is to use this graphic organiser to, to summarise everything up, un, up until this point about examples and non-examples. Once you've done filled in those two lower boxes, then you list the characteristics using those, those, uh, those two ideas. And once you have your list of characteristics, then go ahead and write a paragraph definition of science. Let's turn our attention now to this particular learning objective, that is, describe with examples the scientific methods. So within the sciences, we use four broad categories of methods. And you'll find that depending upon whichever field that you're looking at, all fields within science will employ all four of these fields, maybe not together, but that may be individually. So let's have a look at these. The first type is what we will call descriptive methods. So for example, you might be a botanist, and it might be your job to go out into the rain, Amazon rainforest, you find a new tree, you rip off a branch, a couple of leaves, you squish it between two books, two bits of paper, put a whole heap of books on top, and then you come back to your ar arboretum and you describe it in minute detail, usually within Latin. Or you might be a geologist roaming around 
the badlands over in the United States. You might pick up a rock, you might hit it with your hammer, you might look at it under a uh, hand lens, or you might um, put some acid on it, or you might lick it to look at other properties. Either way, you are a geologist and you are employing descriptive methods because in that instance, you're describing types of rocks or minerals that you're discovering. Or you might be a scientist on board the ship that you can see there, HMS Beagle, and it's your job to, as you go around to new countries, it might be your job to describe the new plants and animals that you find. So for example, a, a good real world example for Australia is the role of uh, Joseph Banks in the original um, in Endeavour. Um, is the role of Sir Joseph Banks in the original Endeavour mission, which was to view the transit of Venus over in Tahiti. And the side mission was to discover this great unknown southern continent in the southern hemisphere. So that's descriptive. There are another broad family or category of methods known as modelling methods. And all branches within science uses, uses modelling. So for example, you might be a physicist and it's your job to test the aerodynamics of vehicles by placing them in a wind tunnel. So you can place a physical model within a wind tunnel and explore the stresses and strains on various components of the vehicle, or you can do it virtually. So you create a virtual model of your vehicle and you place that inside a virtual wind tunnel. Either way, you are modeling what's going on. Okay? Or you might be a geneticist and it's your job to to research various um, human genetic diseases. Now it's unethical to perform certain types of experiments on humans, so we use animal models to, 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 to study those kind of uh, diseases. Or you might use a mice, or, or, sorry. Or you might use a mouse to model the progression of various diseases such as lung cancer or skin cancer or things like that. You could also be a atmospheric scientist, so you might be dis you might be exploring the formation of hurricanes, or you might be a meteorologist whose job it is to track uh, cyclones as they form. Okay. Another type of another type of <coughs> The third broad category of scientific methods is that of theoretical methods. Now, the three gentlemen that you can see on the screen there are largely from the world of physics. Well, they are from the world of physics. That's because it's a technique which is used primarily by what we will call theoretical physicists. So if you are a fan of the Big Bang, within that show, Dr. Sheldon Cooper is the theoretical physicist, and you've also got Then you can look at some real world examples. For example, Dr. Stephen Hawking, who did a lot of work on black holes and phenomena like that. Or you could look at Peter Higgs and his colleagues. So back in the 70s, him and his colleagues, they got together and they developed a mathematical model, a mathematical theory about the existence of, of this field, which they ended up calling the Higgs field. And if you excite that field within a particular way, then it produces a particle of known mass and energy. And so eventually one of the purposes of building the Large Hadron Collider over in Switzerland was to look for the Higgs particle, the God particle, as it's sometimes called in the media. So these are the three broad categories of methods within science. Now these methods are largely shared with other fields um, uh, of knowledge. However, the fourth is unique to science. So this is what sets science apart from other fields. That is that uh, the, the use of the experiment. And when we talk about experiment in science, what we're really talking about is setting up a situation where you're actually testing a hypothesis. And we're going to be going into that particular aspect in more detail in this half of the course. So let's have a look at what we really need to know to understand uh, the role of experiments 
and hypotheses, for example. But before we get on to that, what I'd like to do, what I'd like you to do, is to have a go at ranking what you think the order of importance of these three ideas are within science. So rank them in order of most important in science down to the least important in science. So pause the video, have a go at that, and then come back and we'll keep going. Welcome back. So hopefully you've had a look at that and you've actually now listed what you think is the most important of these three and what is the least important. Now, having said that, all three of these ideas are actually important within science, but some are more important than others. Okay, so let's have a look at each one in turn. So for example, now when you talk to people of the general public and you ask them what a hypothesis is, you generally get the answer that it's a guess, that it's a wild idea, um, that it's an educated guess is another thing that you'll hear m most often. However, in science, and a lot of words have this, have, have this happen to them, within science, when we talk about a hypothesis, we're talking about a very, very specific thing. What we're talking about is a testable statement that explicitly predicts the causal link, and that's the key aspect here, that predicts the causal link between two or more variables. So, so eventually, what we're going to do is have a look at some examples of hypotheses. So here's a good example. Now, this is the phenomenon of, that a lot of, of us are familiar with, is the case of trying to lose weight. Okay? Now, in science, we call that body mass, but potato, potato. Okay? So if losing body mass is the effect that we're interested in, we know that, that that weight loss is actually impacted upon by a whole variety of factors, which we have called C1 through to C5 here. So for example, your genetic makeup, that will determine your ability to lose body mass. Your diet, what you shove in your mouth, that's gonna determine. The amount of exercise you do, how active you are, whether you have a sedentary lifestyle, Lifestyle factors such as smoking and drinking, that will have an impact upon your weight. And also stress has an impact as well. The whole role of science is to figure out what is the direct relationship between each one of these causes and the effect that we're interested in is our fluctuating body mass. How much each one of these factors contributes to the final effect and whether they interact with one another in various ways. So within high school, we teach a very specific type of hypothesis testing, which is just looking at one variable, sorry, one cause to one effect, or one variable to another variable, where when by the time you get to university, that becomes a lot more complicated, and you really want to understand, for example, how all of these factors relate to weight loss, because they interact in, in wild and wonderful ways. And that's the whole purpose of science is actually working all that out. Okay? Incidentally, about 80% of your weight loss efforts actually come down to C2 there, your diet. And so a lot of it's actually determined by what you put in your mouth. So let's have a look at the hypothesis in more detail. The hypothesis itself, when we break that down, hypo meaning under, thesis meaning argument. So the hypothesis is your underlying argument. That is what you're trying to argue when you are creating, a hypothesis, uh, uh, creating an experiment to test an idea or a hypothesis. Now the hypothesis originally comes from the branch of philosophy or mathematics. Take your pick, they can fight about it. It doesn't really matter to us as scientists, but it comes from another field. And when we think about it, science is really born out of philosophy anyway. So it's quite a natural link that we borrow that idea and continue it forward. A hypoth hypothesis, a true hypothesis, actually is a conditional statement which has the structure of if A, if statement A is true, then logically it follows that statement B is also true. And the whole purpose of the experiment is to test the validity of that particular statement. So whenever we write a hypothesis, we have the general form of if a, then B. We have an if segment and then a then segment. Now what follows after the if and then segments will vary from school to school 
and there's a number of ways that you can do it. But at the very heart of it, you need you when you construct a hypothesis, you should always have an if segment and then a then segment. Okay? So here's a uh, template that many schools use. That is the if then because template for hypotheses. So for example, you might be conducting an experiment looking at the effect of light on plant growth. Okay? And so you need to construct a hypothesis if you're going to, going to test that uh, statement. So for example, this could be a hypothesis that a student constructs. So if plant A is put in the sun and plant B is put in the dark. So if you imagine a scenario where I've got two pot plants, I place one on a windowsill in full sun, and I place another in a dark cupboard, which is no sun. So the variable that I'm varying there or changing there is the amount of light. So in the if segment, I talk about the independent variable. In the then segment, this is where I make a specific prediction about which way I think the causal relationship is working. So for example, I, so the variable that we measure or the dependent variable goes in the then segment and as, an example, as our example shows here, plant A will grow more than plant B. Notice how I'm making a very, very specific prediction about which instance is going to win in this particular case. Now, in the if then because frame, then what we do is we provide a scientific reason of why we think there exists this relationship about the amount of light and the amount of plant growth in plants. So there's a great example of a hypothesis in the if then because structure. And the other thing is, is that this kind of experiment is when we think about experiments more generally, uh, would, would be performed in a laboratory because it's a, a laboratory is a highly controlled environment because the only variable that we want to be different between these two cases is our independent variable. In this case, the amount of light. We want them to have the same amount of watering, have the same amount of soil, the same pot size, the same plant age. All other variables need to stay the same for us to really nail down what is the causal relationship between the amount of light and the amount of plant growth. So we can do experiments within laboratories and that's the general case. However, we can perform laboratories, uh, we can perform experiments wherever we like. So for example, here's another hypothesis. So in this case, we're testing the hypothesis of uh, looking at the relationship between the sex of an individual okay, or the gender of an individual and their attendance at say the Indy 500. So for example, we might construct a hypothesis which looks like this. Our independent variable, the variable which is changing in this example is the sex of the individual, whether they are a boy or a girl. The variable that we're measuring or our dependent variable in this instance is Indy attendance. So notice once again how we're making a very specific prediction about who is going to go to the Indy car races more, boys or girls. And then we provide a reason. Now, this isn't a particularly good reason, but you should always try and provide a reason. Okay? And so this is what we call a natural experiment because we weren't able to man directly manipulate the independent variable in this instance. We're just going out, we're observing a natural occurrence of attendance at Indy uh, 500 and then drawing conclusions from that. Okay? So you can perform experiments either in the laboratory or in more natural settings, out, out in the wild, as scientists would say. So let's go through now and define the difference between law, hypothesis and theory, because it's really important for us to differentiate what those three terms mean. Now, when you ask people generally on the street about what they think is more important, law, hypothesis or theory, they will more than likely say law because in everyday life, laws are what governs the running of Australia and it defines what everyone should do. Okay? However, in science, when we talk about law, 
what we're really talking about is just a statement about the relationship be between variables. Okay? So for example, you can see there uh, the gas laws, okay, which relates pressure and volume. You can see the Hooke's law, which looks at the behaviour of elastic materials, which have forces added to them. Or you can look at Snell's law, which looks at the behaviour of light as it passes through different media. Or you might look at uh, Newton's three laws of motion, which obviously describe how things move. Okay? So when we're talking about hypotheses, laws and theories, laws are kind of the, the base okay? of, and is of the lowest form of those three. More important than, the, than laws are the two ideas that we're going to talk about, hypotheses and theories. Okay? So the pinnacle of scientific knowledge is the theory. So as we defined earlier, a theory is an interconnected system of ideas with internal external logical consistency. So it needs to be consistent with ideas outside and inside the field and also be supported by multiple lines of evidence. Okay? So for example, the cell theory, the theory that all living things are made up of cells, or the atomic theory that all things are made up of atoms or, or particles, or the germ theory that, that disease is caused by things called pathogens. So these are the actual pinnacle within science because we're trying to build knowledge over time. That's one of the, the primary reasons of why we do science. So let's have a review. Let's so let's review what was covered in this lecture. We firstly define science, what science is, what science is not. And the way that we define that was by describing and providing examples of the epistemology, ontology and praxis of science. We've also looked at the four types of scientific methods and we gave examples of those. And then we've defined laws, theories and hypothesis. Thank you.